And we're going to start here in probably like one minute. Okay. One What's minute. That? Parker. All righty. So if you can find your seats, we're going to get started. We're going to talk about growing food. We're going to talk about urban agriculture, how urban agriculture can combat climate change. Um, so thank you to those online and in person for being here today. Um, my name is Caroline Chermanix. I am the Chief Operations Officer of the global nonprofit Ideas for Us, um, an accredited NGO of the United Nations. Um, I am also the program director of Fleet Farming. Um, so a little bit about my story. I got involved. Um, I was working at a botanical garden where I got to live there for free. That's another story for another time. But um, I was um, introduced to horticulture school um, at my local community college. And um, I learned about how growing food is so connected to the environment because at a baseline, what do I care about? I care about plants and animals, okay? And so what I did was I connected growing food to that. And I've learned so much since then about, um, about those different, you know, how those things work together. And so um, in 2015, I started um, in the nonprofit of Ideas for Us as a farmer. And um, I kind of just jumped in. I didn't know anything about growing food. Um, I taught myself mostly everything. And um, since then, now in you know, 2022, now I'm the COO, which is one of the highest ranking officers in the nonprofit. And that's just through you know, teaching myself different skills over time. But my, you know, my, my, a lot of my knowledge comes from the world of growing food, agriculture, horticulture. Horticulture means cultivating plants, right? And so um, I'm really excited today to talk about a topic um, that is um, really needed because everybody benefits from food, right? It's something that we're all involved with. The same thing with waste, um, the same thing with clean water. Um, and so we do need leaders to come out and to help us to create the new systems that we're going to have in place for the future of food. Um, so the nonprofit's mission is to develop fund and scale solutions to solve the world's most pressing environmental challenges. And in this session, our environmental challenges are related to habitat, yes, and to um, having um, you know, checks and balances for having ecological systems, but it's also with our food system. So um, this is the program Fleet Farming that we created in 2014. Um, it falls within the food focus area of our nonprofit. This is all the different basic categories or focus areas of the projects that we work with. We do projects every single month all across the world in Africa, Asia, Europe, and three branches here in beautiful Florida. Um, and so with food, we really focus on creating new gardens, um, uh, maintaining gardens that are already there, fruit orchards, permaculture, um, and our ongoing farming um, services where we sell produce and educate people on how to grow food. So what are food solutions in the age of climate change, right? We have so many people on our planet. We have 7.753 billion humans on planet Earth. And that's a lot of hungry mouths to feed, right? And has one of my favorite environmentalists, Vandana Shiva, says is that um, it's not big corporations that feed the world. It's small local farms that majoritively feed a lot of the people in the world. But one thing that everybody should really know about is that our food systems that we currently have, we call them our industrialized food systems. They're set up in a way that is not sustainable. They're set up in a way that doesn't help the ecology of the soil and the ecology of the area and helping people and providing good pay. There's a lot of problems that we currently have in our food systems on that big massive scale. It's, it's hard to keep things going. So that's why um, during my presentation, I'm gonna share how we're kind of starting small from local farms and local food systems, keeping things more local um, to help with some of these global problems that we're having. Um, and I might add, when you see the world like this, don't you feel a sense of responsibility, right? It's such a special place in our solar system with animals and plants and beautiful springs and beaches and forests. 
how can we not feel called to do something about it, right? How can we not feel called to protect it? So for you, it might be in a way that we can grow food, which helps the planet, but it may be planting trees. It may be, you know, advocating for a certain animal like the manatee who needs help right now. So there's a lot of different things that we can do, but I think the worst thing that we can do is to not do anything, right? So um, the state of global food systems and climate change. So this is a little bit of an educational session. We're gonna talk about these concepts um, these definitions, and then we're going to get into like application of it through an example, a case study, which is fleet farming. So climate change is a common thread, devastating impacts of food availability, livelihoods, and human health. As the world experiences increasingly severe climate impacts on agricultural production, many of our food systems are being pushed to the breaking point. In short, climate change is putting food production at risk. Yield, growth for wheat, maize, and other crops have been declining in many countries due to extreme heat, which we definitely experience here in Florida, um, severe weather, Florida, <laughs> and drought. Um, by, by some estimates, in the absence of effective adaptation, which means change, global yields could decline up to 30% by 2050. Countries that are already grappling with conflict, pollution, deforestation, and other challenges are likely to suffer the brunt of these impacts. That basically means that the people that are from our developing countries that are in our low income areas, even in developed nations, um, these are the people who are usually affected the worst and the most. Um, the 2 billion people already without access to sufficient food, including smaller, Smallholder farmers and other people living in poverty will be hit the hardest. Um, and sometimes when we're having these food systems, we're constantly taking, taking, taking from the soil and not putting back. And that is how we're losing soil actually globally. And we're losing a fertility and we're losing um, the future of what that land could be for us. Um, if you want to watch a documentary, you might cry a little bit because uh, it's it's kind of, you know, it's a journey, but it's called The Biggest Little Farm. And I saw that recently. And it's about basically these people who started from land that was just nothing. The, the soil was this degraded or it was really poor soil. And what they did was they started to feed it with compost tea made from worms, worm castings. And then they started to plant fruit trees and it's so many different types of plants. We call that a polyculture many different kinds of plants that have better biodiversity in the area. And then they started to see animals come back. And then they had to deal with all the different animals and making sure that there was a balance of the ecosystem. And it, it, it all had to do with growing food. So it's a really great one if you wanna watch that. Um, and so the state of global food systems and climate change, already despite decades of global commitment, hunger and food insecurity persist at staggering rates. According to the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report, nearly 750 million people experienced severe food insecurity um, in 2019. A number of unnourished or food insecure people is rising with climate shocks a major contributor. Unless urgent action is taken, climate change will increase food prices, decrease food availability, and exacerbate um, or exhaust um, instability, which means people not being able to even be a part of this at all, um, and conflict because of petition over water and fertile land. Whoa, that's kind of big, that's kind of heavy, right? But to kind of break that down uh, is basically that, you know, there's a lot of people in the world who are food insecure, which means that they don't have, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And they even live in this country, they even leave, live in the state of Florida. Um, and so that is something that we really want to um, think about and to provide systems that that's not going to be an issue. Um, so we're, we'll learn more about solutions that can come from that. In addition of, to being affected by the impacts of climate change, agriculture is a major contributor. This is a picture of the Amazon. And this is happening in the Amazon is that football fields full of beautiful pristine habitat are being mowed down for um, unsustainable agriculture. Um, and some of it is cattle industry raising, cattle raising. Um, so and a potential solution to climate change is agriculture. 
Um, in a recent report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found that one third of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the production, distribution, and consu um, consumption of food. When it comes to producing food, the majority of agricultural emissions are related to raising livestock, followed by rice cultivation and the production of synthetic fertilizers. Um, moreover, as forests and grasslands are converted from agriculture, the world is losing vitality in the soil ecosystems that remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there, and we're going to kind of dissect that a little bit more as we go forward too. Um, so here is a graph. Um, and so more and more communities in Florida are becoming urbanized, right? We're moving from where we usually had what's called agriculturally zoned land and we're moving to cities and we're losing that land. It's being pushed farther and farther away from us. And um, so that is something that with wheat farming, the urban agriculture program that I'm working on, we're using land in urban areas. We're using land that isn't really doing anything. We're using grass lands mostly um, from lawns. Um, rural refers to any population, housing, or territory not in an urban area. We are a steady, we see a steady increase in urban areas as opposed to rural, and you can see that in this graph. Um, more than 50% of the world's populations live in rural areas, and by 2050, this figure is projected to rise to 70%. So kind of, you know, the thought is, how do we feed 7.7 .7 billion people in urban areas where we don't even have land. That's a lot that we have to figure out. Um, but that's kind of the fun part of it too, is problem solving and creating solutions from things that may be another challenge, such as food waste and creating that into the systems and using our problems as our solutions too. Um, urban agriculture. So urban agriculture, um, urban farming or urban gardening is the practice of cultivating, processing, and distributing food in or around urban areas. Urban agriculture is the term used for animal husbandry, aquaculture, urban beekeeping, and horticulture. And there is also a lot of ways that animal husbandry can be good for systems. We see this with an example of chickens, right? Um, I think his name is Joe Salinger. Um, there's a farmer that has a, a food system where he has um, different animals that are passing through um, the area and as they walk, they usually eat. They eat sometimes like plants that you don't want growing in that area. That is then, you know, defecated and left on the ground to add natural fertilizer. Um, and then in terms of chickens, chickens can even eat little um, pests that could be eating your crops. So there's things that um, have been used for thousands of years by farmers that can be re-brought to these food systems and rethought instead of spraying everything, you know, having all these different chemicals and just having just such an unnatural system. Maybe we can rethink some of the things that have worked in the past and some new technologies and meet them together to have a food system that is better for the planet and better for ourselves. And that helps to um, have food security within communities. And that means um, it's the measure of the availability of food and individuals' ability to access it. So you guys have probably heard of the term, and I might have that on the next slide, but the term food deserts, right? Anybody want to say what a food desert is? Isn't it an area where people really don't have access to quality food? Exactly. Yeah, they don't have food security. They don't have a readily accessibility to healthy fruits and vegetables mainly. So um, for instance, if, if a community doesn't have access to fruits and vegetables, and if a lot of people in that community don't have access to transportation that's easily and available, like having a car, then what are they given? Sometimes it's a convenience store and it's processed food and it's processed chips. Imagine if you're only eating that kind of food, how that would make you feel, right? And that wouldn't make you feel like you're, you're your best. So I think that, you know, having uh, a focus on food security and providing fruits and vegetables even through food recovery, there's a lot of fruits and vegetables that, you know, for instance, at the grocery store that are never eaten and they're just thrown away. They're perfectly good. Why don't we take that and give it to communities in need? Um, there needs to be way more of that, because if you were to go into a dumpster of um, Publix or um, Whole Foods or something like that, you would be shocked. And not only is it just kind of gross because like the lining of like the dumpster is nasty, but the stuff inside of it is good stuff. 
And they do this because of a profit uh, concept where, you know, they think that they're going to have less sales and less people if they help people with giving them this, this food item. So um, I kind of am in, uh, in favor of dumpster diving where we do it, you know, maybe with an adult and, you know, I don't know, there's maybe when you're older, but there, there's some good things there in food recovery for sure. Um, so benefits of urban agriculture. Um, so these are what, why we want to do this, okay? So we want to increase in vegetation cover. So when you have a neighborhood, let's imagine a neighborhood and it's all concrete and there's no trees. What's, what's that going to feel like in Florida? Hot. It's going to be so hot. And so when you have tree cover and they see, unfortunately, in more wealthier areas, they have better tree cover and it's literally cooler. It's literally cooler in those environments. That's not fair. Right? We need to have more vegetation cover. And also, um, when you think about water being passed on concrete, it usually will move to a storm drain, maybe pushed out into the ocean or et cetera. Instead of if it was like a native beautiful garden, it would pass through and it would be filtered and go into our aquifer. And then it would prevent something like sinkholes, right? Because you don't have that falling in. Um, um, so the next is cultivation of soil for carbon sequestration. That's a big concept. I'm kind of still a little bit confused. I'm like, what? Um, but basically, tending the soil can help to absorb carbon and to have less um, of the negative effects of that in our environment, right? Something like that. Um, it can also reduce flooding, as I just mentioned, reduce transportation costs to the environment. That's the biggest one to me. So when you go to Publix and you buy something like a tomato for a dollar, how is that tomato worth a dollar? When you think about it, they have farms, um, for instance, let's say farms in Guatemala that are growing these tomatoes that get shipped um, with trucks to an airport that gets put into a plane that gets put into another truck that goes to a, a washing center, maybe, or a processing center that then goes to the, the grocery store. How is that only a dollar? And it's only a dollar because of the lack of care of the environmental cost that the transportation has that they're putting out emissions from transporting these but also the people the people are not being paid what they should be paid they're not being paid what they deserve to be paid working such long hours and you know un unsafe weather events sometimes and using chemicals and it's just there's a lot of things that you know i think that we as a people we don't want to be involved with that but we are Right. And so it's just learning about how we can support a better world and a better system and just being able to identify like, yeah, this is a problem that we have right now and that we're trying to solve. Um, increasing food security and accessibility, providing space for community engagement and promoting diversity. There is a world where we can have our natural environment thriving with people and we can eat and we can grow food and we can live in these communities together. Like this is the world that I, I really so, so much with all my heart want to see happen. And it's possible. And I've seen examples of this. Um, but the biggest example I've seen of this is a, a concept called permaculture, where you're creating food forests and communities, you're planting fruit trees, you're using that medium that's not doing anything to grow loquats and, you know, berry bushes and, and different things that then feed the animals and have the whole system benefit. So Let's learn how to do that. So here's some of our options. Um, I, of course, love to get my hands in the soil because I love the fact that it helps to sequester carbon. I love the fact that there is a whole ecosystem in the soil. And when you have healthy soil, you have healthy plants, right? Um, there's a whole science to that. There's a whole science to learning about how um, you can take a soil test and learning about, you know, the elements on a periodic table of elements, right? Um, so there's different, we call them um, macro and micronutrients in the soil. So we have N, nitrogen, P, phosphorus, K, potassium, Mg, magnesium, Mn, malignum. We have um, boron, we have iron, we have all these other elements from that periodic table that's in the soil that we want to help in tender, calcium. And they all determine how healthy our plants are. Um, so there's square foot gardening where you can have like a raised bed that's like a grid system. Um, there is permaculture that looks kind of like this. Yeah, that looks pretty cool, doesn't it? So it's all these different plants working together in a harmony. So there's something called companion planting where certain plants are friends. 
Certain plants grow well together. They give each other nutrients. They help each other taste better. They help to prevent pests together. So that's like basil and tomato. Um, and then there's plants that don't do really well together like tomatoes and potatoes. They don't work well together because they need the same things. They attract the same um, pests. And their roots, if you see their roots, they're all, they're both kind of similar. They're searching for water and nutrients and they're heavy feeders. So maybe they're not so good of friends. But when you have this good harmony in the soil, um, this is a form of companion planting that can be found in a concept of permaculture. Permaculture is a set of design principles centered on whole systems thinking, stimulating or directly utilizing the patterns and resilient features observed in natural ecosystems. That's a better way than what I just said, but um, that's the definition. And you know, as we have, we know an increase in urban areas, we're gonna to have to use buildings, right? And actually, one of the most sustainable things that we can do for our water is to support hydroponics and aeroponics. Why? Because it's a closed loop system. The, the water, basically in an aeroponic system, um, air means uh, it, the roots are suspended in the air. Hydro means that um, the roots are sustained in the water. And then aquaponics is using fish droppings as fertilizer, which to me is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, they usually use tilapia. Um, and when you have systems like this, the water is still trading through itself. And maybe you're adding some fertilizers. It doesn't have to be synthetic um, or nasty fertilizers. If you didn't know, when people harvest synthetic fertilizers, when they don't use like natural things like Oh my gosh, there's so many cool ones. Chicken manure, horse manure, uh, yeah, bat guano, uh, worm castings, all that stuff is the good stuff. But whenever you buy something like a bag of fertilizer, um, sometimes that comes from a place. I don't know if you guys have seen Lord of the Rings and you know what Mordor is, but basically they're basically mining this stuff out of the earth and it looks pretty scary. Um, so that one we don't really like so much, but maybe some of these other ones are better. Right, and they do, they've been used for hundreds of years. Um, worm castings being my favorite, followed up by kelp meal, followed up by chicken manure. That's just me. Um, and so these are some systems that we can have to grow food. So case study, fleet farming. Um, so fleet farming basically was introduced in 2014. We had a, a design meeting called the Hive, a think tank. And we said, okay, we want to have a food system here, but we don't have any land. What do we do? And in that meeting, people were like, I have a lawn, I have a backyard, I have a medium, I have this and this and that. And so that's how fleet farming was made. It was from the community. We said, okay, well, we're going to get some bikes because we're super local. Um, we're going to get some bike trailers and some shovels and some seeds, and we're going to farm your land for you. So we had a, a program called the Lawn Donation Program. And um, that went viral right when I started in 2015. We, we were on NBC Nightly News and all, NPR All Things Considered and Greenpeace Magazine and um, Urban Farmer and all these other big outlets. And we had people all around the world, thousands, saying, I have land in New Zealand I can donate. I have this and I have that. And it was just such like a wow, like we really could be using all these spaces if we could just match make a gardener with land that people didn't want to mow. Boom, that's a great idea for me, especially um, if it's like an elderly person and you're a young person that wants to farm their land and give them food. <laughs> you know, it's just an easy yes. Um, and so that's how we got started. Um, that's me, that's my best friend who got me into it, uh, Michelle. And that's us um, farming, that's what it typically looks like. Um, these are the reasons of why, okay? So we have monocultures. This is um, a bunch of tractors in monoculture land farming one crop. When you only have one crop for thousands of acres, okay, that's hard to conceptualize, but thousands of acres, one crop, um, sometimes that crop is even just seed corn. It's not even edible corn. It's corn for corn syrup um, and, and animal feed. And when you're doing that, the plants, they communicate with the environment. They put out something called volatile organic compounds or VOCs, which is a chemical odor that they put out through their leaves above the soil, and then they put out through their roots. And they use that to talk to each other and to communicate. They can share nutrients, they can share water. They can also know that one grass on this side of the yard is communicating with this grass on the other side of the yard saying, we're getting mowed over here. And so um, when you have all one plant putting out the same uh, signals or volatile organic compounds into the, 
environment, what's happening? You get tons of pests. You get tons of problems. You have to get tons of the same things getting ripped out of the soil, the same nutrients, the elements on the periodic table being ripped out of the soil. You get the same water being sucked up. It's just not the system of nature. When you think about the Amazon, the Amazon is thousands of different kinds of plants and animals working together. And that's how those systems work. And they create leaf litter on the forest floor that has the most biodiverse soil anywhere in the world. And that's because of the detritus or like the, the dying, the, the, the cycle of, of death and life that is in the soil. And so when you have a food forest, maybe you have fruit trees and you have gingers and you have turmerics all working together, you're creating that forest environment and you're creating that fertility in the soil. There's no fertility in that. And honestly, this is a big um, contributor to nearby waterways being impacted, nearby everything being impacted, humans being impacted. They have to have all those chemicals that gets passed through their pores, that get passed through generations of their families. Now that's some deep stuff right there. Um, also lack of farm workers rights. Even in Florida, there's a book called Tomato Land, if you wanna check that out. It's about modern day slavery happening within our food systems. It was generally excluded in human rights conversations. Um, and as we were developing the rights of humans um, in, the, in America, um, there's a, a lot of different documentaries about that, um, where I think it was like in the 20s where, um, you know, they started to have these more like uh, rules on labor and it didn't include our food system people. And that's not really unfair. Um, pesticide pollution, whereas there's 40 million acres of lawn in, the, in America and the average age of the American farmer is 68 years old. That's an opportunity. That's a huge opportunity for us to engage the youngest generations to want to grow food in a way that's really fun and accessible. We could ride our bikes and listen to music and we could use land that is not being used for anything else. Not anything else important anyway. Um, and where does this history of lawns come from? Like, what does this come from? So funny enough, think about the, um, the Renaissance, the 16th century Renaissance in France and England where they started to say, we don't need our land. We don't need farmers. We, we can just you know, have that land for recreation and we can have a lawnmower. These lawnmowers were so beautiful, I have to say, because they were a status symbol. And it began as a status symbol of landowners that said, I don't need to be able to, to even work on my lawn. I'm going to have it be cut and manicured. And now, you know, 2022, we still have this concept and if you're to ask somebody like, why do you have grass? They'd be like, I don't know. Everybody has grass, you know? And you have to maintain it. You have to mow it. You have to fertilize it. Um, you have to water it. Um, whereas you could have native landscaping plants that you don't really have to do any of that because it's what naturally was here in the first place, right? Or you can have an edible garden. So lawns today, um, there's, they require 30 to 60% of the city's fresh water. So I care about water. I care about our springs and our manatees. So I should care about lawns being over water, right? Um, they can require fertilizer to heavy in nitrogen and phosphorus, N and P, right? Nitrogen helps to get the plants growing and to be tall, um, which you don't usually want in grass. And then phosphorus helps to make their, um, helps to have the plant, have a, a, a vigor, I believe. Um, uh, you can encourage the use of toxic herbicides or pesticides. Unfortunately, I hate to see people going outside and spreading poison because it's almost mindless. We, it's just almost like people touch have been, always done it and you're not questioning why we're doing it, right? Um, and what that effect has on the environment. Um, lawns occupy land that could otherwise be used for growing food or better yet, native landscaping. Um, and they release greenhouse gases from the lawn maintenance side of it. We need fuel. Um, so there's a better way. Localized food systems, small local food systems, can reduce harmful agricultural pra um, practices. They can improve access to healthy lifestyles, and they can keep our dollars local. When I'm giving my dollar to someone at a farmer's market who's selling me tomatoes, I'm giving it to them and their family rather than me giving it to Walmart or to give it to Publix, where there's basically these, you know, not as good as giving it to somebody and having it keep local, kept local in your community. So the person at the farmer's market will be using that money to maybe buy from other vendors, or maybe they're 
buying from a local store and you're keeping those dollars local rather than having it just go all to those big, big companies because then they have more power over us, right? And this is a process. It's not gonna just start tomorrow where we can do this. But I think farmer's markets are the first way that we can say, I care about this, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna grow food and I'm gonna go support another farmer at a farmer's market. So we transform lawns into productive micro farms with um, a biodiversity of different kinds of plants being grown together. Um, how do we start? So we basically started from um, people from that community meeting, people wanting to get involved. We use something for called a tiller that helps to um, till up the dead grass. Before we used this, we used a big sheet, a big tarp that we put bricks around to suffocate the grass. So then when we removed the tarp over like a month, the, the grass is really brittle. And so the tiller, we only use this at the beginning, um, just helped to take up all that grass so then there was no chance that the roots would grow back even though they do it's Florida. Um, and then we added a bunch of compost and we added that into rows. We got this beautiful trailer provided by Cliff Bar um, and um, connected to our bikes. And that's how we got people together to farm these lands, to bring them to farmer's markets. And now we have this system and we have um, about 13 farms right now. Um, so they can look at two different ways with us. Um, now three different because now we're having fruit orchard plots which I'm really excited about. Um, some of the new plots that we're doing have bananas and a pretty even row. Bananas with turmeric and ginger, lemongrass and herbs. And that's our new model. Um, we'll also add sometimes um, sweet potato, a couple sweet potato in that. And that's a different way. That's a different option. That's a more wild version. This is the cleanest version. And the raised beds actually help to hold in a lot of water and nutrients. So I like the raised beds, but you do have to replace the wood every five years. Or you could do it in the ground, which most farmers do, which is good, but it also, um, the water and the nutrients kind of get spread out a little bit more. So you might have to add a little bit more in there, especially when you have sand, sandy soil. Um, permaculture, like I talked before, this is like an example of what it can look like. Ooh, it's like a little jungle, like a little forest. And it's all edible. It's like a Willy Wonka, you know, playland out here. And so we have yucca and cassava that's growing in here. That's the root crops. We have banana, we have um, mango trees and avocado trees, and we have these um, edible spinaches, perennial spinaches. Um, and there's a lot of different forest-like systems where you're chopping and dropping, and um, it's just really cool to be, and it's more of a wild sense of growing food. Um, and you probably have a permaculture group in your area that you could join if you're interested in that. Um, so what is sweet farming? So we have our lawn donation program where we turn the average American farm into a productive farm. Um, micro farm. Um, and then we have our edible landscaping, edible landscaping service, which I'll get into, and our education. So this one looks like 13 front or backyards in a, one neighborhood called Audubon Park. We did that because we can only bike so far. It is, if we don't want to rely on the, on the automobile, this is a different thing. We also have a um, golf cart that using um, uh, electricity, um, electric golf cart. Um, and uh, we use our staff and interns and volunteers to maintain these systems. And the food is given to the farm host. Um, it's given to our CSA program. It's basically like a weekly basket of produce. And it's also um, sold at SNAP certified farmer's markets. These farmer's markets allow for people who don't have money for produce to be able to go there and exchange tokens, an exchange of money. Um, and so they can get a lot of produce using this awesome system called SNAP. Um, and also donations to local food banks. Um, so we have a lot of different options where we have um, an excess of food that's not going to be good the next week that we then give to another food bank in the area. So um, we're not having any waste. And if we have some waste, it's getting composted, um, which is better, better than, you know, sending it to the landfill. Um, so Edible Landscapes was created because we really needed something to help fundraise our program because it's really hard to fundraise to pay for everything when you're only selling produce because people don't want to pay that much for produce. I understand that. So we created a landscaping service that we had this long wait list of everybody who wanted to be involved with our program where you're able to say, we are going to build gardens for all of you. And um, so it's mainly as a service. So people bought, purchase gardens from us, which is a really great revenue generator for the program. Um, but also we work with businesses, nonprofits, programs, foundations who pay for community gardens. And so we've done, um, uh, I have it on the other slide, 
but uh, over 26 school gardens. We've done um, gardens for women's shelters, women who are recovering from drug and alcohol abuse, veteran centers, churches, restaurants, retirement communities, um, where they don't, even if they don't have the money themselves, we help to match make a donor and to give them a garden and to give them a plan of maintenance and education for at least the first year to make sure that it's successful. Um, we install raised beds, fruit orchards, which is my new favorite, honestly, um, and perennial landscaping. Um, and so we know that landscaping is a seven, $78 billion industry and less than 1% offer edible landscaping services. That sounds like a lot of opportunity for someone who wanted to start a little business to have a business where you are buying wood, buying soil, or buying plants, or all of that, and helping to plant that for people and helping to create systems where it's easy to maintain. You're providing a lot of mulch on top, you're providing drip irrigation, which you can learn how to set up, or you can do that irrigation timer with a hose on a sprinkler, which is the easiest way. Um, and you can really make a huge impact and you can have a little job for yourself. So I really like that idea. Um, and these are some of the different things that we offer. So what is uh, fleet education? So we're at a number of different schools. Um, we have programming at um, a K through eight school. We have a programming at all the schools that we have installed community uh, school garden. Um, we have the option of them working with us ongoingly. Um, but the biggest thing is that we have a Jones and Evans High School program where we um, are doing a, a agricultural um, support for those students to get into the agriculture industry right out of high school. And so not only are they paid through our program by the state of Florida um, and the city of Orlando um, as interns, but also after that, we help to match make them with different employers in the area. And there's actually a lot of different options that they have. Um, and we have just tons and tons of workshops and presentations. And um, I have a, a series of presentations at of libraries and uh, at a, a, a health center where we have free monthly classes on butterfly gardening, which I'm really excited about, um, composting, fruit tree, how to grow fruit trees, um, all these different topics to make it accessible to people to want to learn. Because this is a, an active thing that we're doing is we're learning more and more about how to grow food. Um, and uh, we focus on engaging, educating, and empowering. Basically, that means that getting people's hands actually in the soil, but also talking about why and talking about the bigger things that make us care a little bit more. Um, so some things that have gone really well from it, we have about 200 interns just for fleet farming every year. And that's in spring, summer, and fall. Um, and uh, we also, with Ideas for Us, have 16 different internship options. A lot of them are online, which is super accessible to people. So anybody could join. If you wanted to join our Eagle Action Organizers um, of Florida group, um, where you basically plan Eagle Action projects um, in our different branches, or if you wanted to join our social media team, or if you wanted to join in um, video production team, or um, um, be an admin for myself and um, our higher up staff. Like there's so many different options that you could be with us. Um, we do have fleet farming though, where you could be a farmer, you could be um, a greenhouse intern, or you could be a, um, a farmer's market business intern and help us think about the business side of things. Um, and so these are the different schools that I talked about earlier about us to be involved with the garden club. So I love Vandana Shiva. She's one of my favorite environmentalists, but she says the time has come to reclaim the stolen hearts and to celebrate the growing and giving of food, of good food as the highest gift and the most revolutionary act. Wow, that I kind of just sat that with that for a while. And um, you know, if you read one of her books called like Who, Who Feeds the World, this is like a big concept in the book. And um, it really is one of the biggest things that we can do. So it's whether we want to say, okay, this year, I'm just gonna grow all of my herbs at home. We're not gonna go out and buy herbs. I'm just gonna have all of them at home and that's how I'm gonna get started. Or that's saying, you know, for my birthday this year, I really wanna plant a fruit tree. Or if that's saying, I wanna grow a little garden. Or if that's saying, I'm gonna try to go to the farmer's market every weekend. Um, those are all really great ways to get started in this concept. Uh, so suggestions for agriculturalists, and I have a lot of them, so I'm just going to generalize here. So finding land, so there's so much land to be had. Um, farmer backyards are usually the best because they're privately owned and people are there, they can water things in, they can help you. Churches usually have a ton of land, and I really like the idea of an eco-church 
having a church that has fruit tree orchards and edible gardens because there's so much community at these places, right? And there's a lot of time that people spend. So why don't we have more programs like that? Um, HOA land, um, school, local businesses, nonprofits. There's just a lot of different places. This is one that we have at a local food hub or restaurant, a series of restaurants at this place. Um, and we have the front yard that we maintain as our one of our gardens. Um, so having a place that is a high impact, high traffic area is great. Um, this is how you do it. You basically remove the turf grass, tuck the, the turf grass with a tarp or sheet mulching. You can even just cover grass with cardboard um, and mulch. That's easy enough to kill the grass underneath it. Um, add soil, form the soil into rows or into raised beds. Um, I like the idea of using logs from the side of the road and making that into really fun shapes of the garden, um, filling that with soil and some seeds. Um, I like a resource called IFIS that has um, information on what to plant during what month. Um, so you know every single month what you should be planting and just doing some Googling of like, what's the best kind of tomatoes to grow in South Florida or et cetera. And um, that can help you to know what to plant. So at that point, you have a garden built you have a basic garden built, you have, you know when to plant, you know what to plant, and then it's just caring for it. So the two things I would do to care for the garden are worm castings or kelp meal as your fertilizer. Um, typically those are really great. Um, or, and you can use as your pest deterrent, something like neem oil or um, sudsy soap, or I just honestly go in my plants and I just kind of like squeeze the bugs that I don't want. Um, or I put the worms like the tomato hornworm, I put that on my bird feeder. And then my birds come down and they're like, yes. Yeah. So it's like kind of a closed loop system with that. Uh, so those are some ideas. And having a garden party, you don't have to do it alone. So if you play music, have some pizza, and you have all your friends and family come out and do the hard part, oof, that's so much easier on you. Um, so tips and tricks to maintain these operations. Drip irrigation to me is a must. So if you go on a vacation, you come back, your garden is dead. That's not so good. So I would have it on a drip irrigation system or um, having an Oya. It's like a ceramic pot that you fill with water. They're good sometimes um, where you can fill that with water and it kind of goes out. But I really like the idea of an irrigation timer, a hose and some sort of drip system or sprinkler. Um, you can get free mulch from local arborists. You can get bulk soil deliveries from local soil providers. You might have to do a little bit of Googling on that. Um, you can cover crop in the summer with things like um, pumpkin and watermelon and sweet potato. So it'll cover the soil from the sun and produce a harvest at the end of the year or at the end of the season before um, the best season to grow, which is fall to spring. Um, and companion planting is the biggest hack that there is, knowing which plants work well together and which plants don't. Um, and we learned, I think I talked about the last class, did I talk about volatile organic compounds in this class? I don't think so. So basically how plants communicate is they send out, oh yes, I did, yeah, 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 I did. Yeah. Um, and so companion planting is a, a good example of that. So companion planting is saying that these plants just work well together and it makes it so much easier to grow when you know that and you can just Google all that. Um, so this is some um, ideas on multiple revenue streams. So you have your farmer's market, your CSA weekly baskets, vendor sales, lawn donation um, agreements like what we have, edible landscaping services if you want to make some money to be able to do this for people as a service, fruit tree planting services, the same thing. Oh my gosh, if I did this as a kid, I would have had my own fruit tree planting service and I would have been fundraising to do my action projects by uh, having people purchase fruit trees for me and having me install them in their, their lawns. Can somebody please pick that up and do that because that would be really cool. Um, and then something called value added products. So something that makes something like tomatoes more expensive, expensive is cutting those tomatoes up and make them into a salsa and selling that salsa. You can almost double, triple, quadruple the price of the actual food by adding something to that. A great example of this is cutting up um, radishes and pickling them. The pickled radishes you can sell for like $7 versus the radishes themselves you can sell for like three. Uh, so that's a really good idea. And agricultural summer camps, we're having some. We're having one called Save the Planet Summer Camp in Orlando, Florida. Um, and there's other ideas that you could have. So um, the last thing is connecting with different communities. Um, I really love Facebook events. I think that's a really easy way to share things. We also keep everything on Instagram. 
we use something called Buffer, where you post it um, on Buffer and then uh, it posts to Instagram and Facebook and Twitter for us in a schedule. So you could just do all of that work on one day and kind of drip it out online. Um, and also TikTok. TikTok is, you know, coming coming to be more in our environment of um, getting our events out and showing people who we are. So there's all these different ways that you can connect with different communities to make sure that you support projects like this. Um, and really it's about closing this whole loop in the system. And there's a place for everybody. There's a place for people who love to grow food like me, people who love um, to process the food, um, maybe somebody who likes to cook distribution of that food, making sure that I wanna make sure that that, that homeless community gets this food um, um, having that be accessible, consuming the food. Some people just like to eat and that's okay too. And then having that food be recovered in the system. So I'll leave you with one last thing. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, Margaret Mead. So thank you guys so much. And um, if you have any questions, please let me know.